introduce to you, is it three o'clock yet? Almost three o'clock, we'll wait a minute. Hey, speaking of California, now Nicole is in Northern California. Are you, Stephanie, are you in LA? Yes. You are. And so in LA, um, are you affected by the fires? Um, our skies were completely blackened or grayed uh, last week. It's now well, kind of blue. It's almost hard Blue-ish. to describe the color of the sky. <laughs> it, it literally, there was one, a couple of days last week when you walked outside and it felt like you were in a bad um, apocalyptic Steven Spielberg movie. Yeah. Really bad. It was but I'm not, my house is not in danger. Not this time. I've, we've been evacuated before over the years, but right now, now it's, um, it's outer. So we just oh, get the bad. Oh, thank God you're okay. I mean, gosh. It's crazy. It looks like it was oh, at one or two days totally dark in the middle of the day. It the, was. The, the street lamps were on. Wow. Yeah, you have it worse. You, where, where are you, Nicole? What part of Northern California? I'm in Brentwood. I'm about an hour outside of San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah, it's horrible up there. Yeah, it was a trip. It was a trip. It was, it was, it was hard for, especially on this one day, it was hard for my brain to conceive what was going on. It really was weird. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. sure. Well, yeah. it's 301, and I want to respect all of your time. Um, Jan Copeland here with uh, a special bonus uh, mastermind, a bonus interview, if you will, with three amazing ladies so i'm going to introduce you right now right now stephanie do you wave stephanie and by the way before i begin can you all mute yourselves because i want to make sure we get quality audio and um and that way we can respect each other so um <clears throat> stephanie is the number one agent in keller williams and stephanie you look young there's no way you've been in this 32 years did i see <laughs> that right or is that wrong i have to unmute myself i started when i was 12 yeah well see now that makes sense <laughs> 32 years unbelievable and um she's listed um in real trends wall street journal top 100 agents in the united states of all brokerages number one in keller williams um based on total sales volume and 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 i'm just reading this from your website there's three things that she attributes to her success so hard work okay do the freaking work, right? DT, FW. Attention to detail and extraordinary client experience. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Okay. And I know that for a fact, Stephanie is, um, I'd love you to be my agent. So let's welcome Stephanie. She's amazing. Um, and then the next one that we're going to introduce is um, somebody at, at EXP. Uh, and it's um, Katie Spaniak. Hi, Katie. Hi, how are you? Good. And I forgot. And now I'm, now I'm like nervous. That was. Oh, don't be nervous. Wow. Um, Stephanie is in California. Katie is in <laughs> Illinois, right, Katie? Yeah, we're outside okay. of Chicago. And, um, and so Katie um, sells over 50 million a year and she has a team. Um, and that's 80 to 100 plus homes sold per year. And um, she has a really neat, I love your website, um, Katie. Um, I like how you, you just enumerated things. Um, and so definitely check these, check these ladies out. They are top, mm -hmm. top notch. Now, um, Katie is an icon agent at, um, at EXP, which means that she didn't pay. She was hundred percent all year. She didn't pay. Um, she got her cap back. So congratulations to Katie. Thank you. Thank you. And then the next person, um, the third person is not here yet. Um, but she, I don't know, hopefully she'll come. And that's Kara Pierce, and she's in Little Hershey, Pennsylvania, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And um, she has sold over 150 homes herself, and then she has a team that um, they've sold almost 200 um, in the last 12 months. She was, I met her because she was in 2017, the, one of the 30, 30, and 30, 30 under 30 by Realtor Magazine. And um, she's just really unique. And um, I don't know, all these women are just amazing. I can't say enough about them. So um, Kara says my link is not working. Okay, so if you guys would bear with me, let me grab the link and get it over to her. Bear with me. Uh, let's see, one second.
All right. So the way this is going to work is that I'm going to um, ask a question and I'll call on either Stephanie or Katie or Kara. And um, ladies, um, they are going to tell us the truth, the, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Right, ladies? Thank you. you bet. All right. So um, Stephanie, I'm going to start with you. Okay. So um, talk to us about uh, one of the biggest mistakes that you've ever made and how that has catapulted you forward as opposed to pulling you down, if, if you could speak to something like that. So I've made lots of mistakes. Um, probably the biggest mistake that I would say now looking back over the past three decades would be that I, so I'm in, I'm just outside of Los Angeles. I'm in Los Angeles, but I'm outside of the city. I'm in the San Fernando Valley, which think Kim Kardashian, Calabasas, that, that puts us on the map. So what I would have done differently is the average sales price in the San Fernando Valley. And I realized that this may sound ridiculous based on where you are in the country, but the San Fernando Valley is the feeder to the city. So we are considered the suburbs, the cheap seats. So our average is six hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars. So you work just as hard if the house has a zip code of the, the San Fernando Valley as you do of Beverly Hills or Brentwood. So I guess looking back now, I would have moved my body over there and established myself in a higher price point. Just because it's if you're going to do if you're going to sell two hundred homes, you may as well sell two hundred homes. If you, if you are close to a location that has more zeros behind it, why not? That's oh, probably the that. biggest mistake. I love that. And so before we leave you, I want a follow-up question to that. So as you move forward, are you purposefully focused on the, the other zip codes that have no. The, the, no? I've established, I'm so rooted where I am to start over now in a new zip code. I don't have the energy. <laughs> okay. Got it. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, are you independent with an assistant or do you have a team now? So uh, I have, so I structure my business a little differently than the majority of agents do because when I got in the business in the late eighties and then I started to grow my business, I realized I needed to leverage my time. And the natural thing to do was to hire other agents. Nobody was doing that at that time. There was no buyer's agent. So I naturally went to somebody and just said, hey, I'll give you my buyers and we'll share them and you can just work with me. And um, my broker sat me down and said, you can't do that. You're not the broker. So um, they didn't allow that. So I had to figure out a workaround, which was to do it administratively. So the majority of my team, and yeah, I have a team. I can't, I can't sell, no one can sell, I shouldn't say no one. I can't sell 200 houses a year, like with one person, that's just not realistic. So um, I do have one, two, three, four, five, six administrative people of which one, two, three have licenses and um, they help me every which way. Okay. But I'm the only one that goes on listing appointments. Okay. And, and so the others who are licensed do serve as a, a pseudo buyer's agent then? They, they, they go out with buyers? I have one. Uh, actually, I have two that have licenses that will show buyers. But the rest are in office working on a salary that I pay them Monday through Friday, mostly nine to six, um, sometimes later. Try, they try not to work on the weekend. I try to get them to work on the weekend. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Well, that's excellent. I like that. Um, all right. So, hi, Kara. Glad you could join us. And um, we're going to. Hey, Kara. Hey, Jan. I'm sorry. I'm restarting my computer because it's freaking out. That's sorry. okay. We just wanted to say hello. I did introduce you with love as I did the other two ladies. So we'll let you get squared away. And the next question is going to go to Katie. Um, Katie, you have a team. And could you please share with us when you made the move to go from independent to a team. And if you wish you would have gone earlier and the third part of that, because I think they're all related. So mm -hmm. is, did you start with an admin? Did you start with a realtor that was a buyer's agent or just talk to us about that whole process? Okay. So I'm just going to be totally 
real with everyone. Um, my path to having a team has been rough. Um, you know, I've, I've been selling for eight years. Um, and so my, and I sell locally in the suburbs north of Chicago. So, and I grew up here. So I had already kind of name recognition. So I could kind of walk into that a little bit. Um, but I really went catapulting um, for coming into the industry. And so I, um, I was with an independent brokerage in the Chicagoland area. And then actually I moved to Keller Williams and Keller Williams is all about teams. And I was like all in and I'm ready to do it. And I did a, I did a pretty good job, but um, I, I've had, this is going to sound horrible. Stephanie's probably going to get this too. I've had like 30 agents on my team at some point. So um, it's really, really, really hard to get good agents on the team. And so I started with an admin right out of the gate because that's the type of person I am. I don't like administration and I'd rather pay somebody to help me. So for me, that mental shift was very easy. I know there are a lot of agents that don't want to pay somebody to help them. But for me, it was worth $50,000 a year so that I didn't have to do the paperwork and I could have a little more time with my family. Um, if you don't have that mindset, it, you just, you can't make the jump. You know, some people aren't willing to give away that money. For me, it was worth it. So I started with that. And then I started just kind of bringing people on my team. And I was like, yeah, this sounds great. This will be fun. Come on my team. Um, and then I realized that I was giving away leads because I, I believe that um, everybody else was going to do what, like, do it like I did, right? Where you get a lead and you don't let it go. Right. And I thought everybody else was the same way I was. And so I was like, this is awesome. I'll give this person a lead and I'll make 50% on this rather than working my butt off and making a hundred. What I didn't really take into consideration is I was literally giving money away by giving those leads away because I would have closed those deals. And instead, these people were not, they weren't closing them. They're like, oh yeah, I forgot about that person. And so I gave away hundreds of thousands of dollars um, by giving away leads and not understanding the significance of, of that. It was almost like I was literally giving them money. So um, I've had to sort of reassess over the last year. I'd say I kind of came back around and was like, okay, I need to refocus. I'd spent a lot of money on lead generation, a lot of money for my team. I spent a lot of money teaching my team and education and I wasn't getting it reciprocated. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't getting, you know, it was a fight to get people to want to have a team meeting. And I'm like, you know, let's do this together. But it, it wouldn't, it wasn't working. Um, and so I took a step back and right now I've got, uh, basically a COO who's licensed. Um, she doesn't sell, um, but it's great because she is licensed. It can help me with all that licensed work. And I do have a new buyer's agent who's been with me about six months. She's really only been selling for the last three and she's got two and 2.7 million in closings coming up. So I finally feel like I've gotten kind of the the, the movement going with this. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as being able to build a team, you have to go into it and recognize that it's not, it's very, it can be very expensive. It can be a real waste of your time. And if you don't do it correctly, you're going to end up starting all over again. Mm -hmm. That's my thought on it. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it sounds like um, you, you've, you have a lot of good lessons learned, right? And so oh, yeah. I assume yeah. now you have contracts with an agent, with whoever the agents are that, that are on your team that say, this is what you can expect from me. This is what I can yes. expect from you. And by the way, to be on this team, these are the kind of rules in play that we're going to have weekly meetings and that we're going to do these things. Am I right? Yeah. And I did before too. Um, I think a lot of it was, I took a lot of new people into the business. And so I think that was probably the downfall is not having people who really knew what this was about. They really knew how to sell. And this is hard because you really have to go about six months without an income. And if you can't get over that three to six month, you know, deal without having an income, some people back out. And so they get frustrated, they get nervous. Um, so I did have that and they would tell me what they wanted to do. They'd say, yes, I want to make $150,000. I'm like, awesome. Then let's do it. 
but then they didn't realize how hard this business really, really is. Right. And I think that's the key is when you bring people onto your team, if they don't have sales experience, it's going to be a really rough go. It, it will be, it doesn't have to be in real estate, but it really needs to be um, some sale selling experience that has been on a commission commission basis. My connection's unstable. Okay, sorry, I guess it's my connection that's unstable. Sorry about that. No worries. Okay, so what I wanted to say about that is, ladies, because I know some of the ladies wanted to start teams, and we're not always going to just talk about teams, ladies, but I, I want to get to the bottom of this. And that is that you have to be very careful when you hire, and, and even though they're not employees, an agent is not an employee, there's an agreement, and that you, you know, try them out, test drive them. And, and there's a whole in, intake process that I would recommend um, in having a team. So now Katie, I applaud you for having a coup and, you know, a chief operating officer who, who kind of works, you know, as your partner. So now Kara, good to see you. Um, the question, oh, you can unmute yourself if you would. Um, okay. Hey. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> okay. So my question for you is, um, do you have a morning habit or talk to me, talk to us about your schedule and your habit because you, you're a mother of two very young children as some of our, the people on this call will be, whether they're live or listening to it. So can mm -hmm. you talk to us about, um, your personal situation? I know that your husband kind of, you know, works with you and he took a sabbatical, but I really, I love your honesty and your candor. So just talk to us about, um, your schedule, your habits. You want me to be honest? Yes, please. I do. <laughs> <laughs> you look gorgeous, by the way. Love the hair. Thank you, so do you. Uh, okay. As I was listening to the gurus, uh, Stephanie and Katie talk, I was thinking, you know, I think there were two. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think there are two stages in my business. You know, not that I've been in it very long, but I think there was the stage when I was really hustling because I needed the money because you know my husband was a medical student I just left medical school with a lot of debt we just had a new baby so we needed money so my schedule lifestyle team structure all that was different at that stage I'm at the stage now where I've sort of built a nice little cushion so I don't have to make as many business and personal choices on the finance. Does that make sense? Yeah. So actually I've sort of been in a transition recently with my schedule. In the hustle phase, which was not that long ago, I was working round the clock. Um, since I have the little children, three and six years old now, I wanted to, the, it wouldn't make sense if I couldn't spend quality time with them. So I would spend the time I needed to with them and then um, work pretty much at night. Sometimes I would pull all nighters and sometimes, you know, I'd give it up at 3 a.m. or 5 a.m. or something. Um, and then I would take micro naps, you know, during the day or as I needed to. Now I'm slowly transitioning from that to Around eight o'clock maybe, or maybe a little earlier sometimes, I'll just disconnect from work and focus on the family. And then once the kids are back in bed, I'll go through my uh, emails and messages and such. And depending on the day, I will give myself more sleep and rest. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm not saying I recommend that for everybody, but my schedule has sort of been nighttime with with naps during the day mm -hmm. and that's just and, being honest right and i appreciate that when i met you your kids were much younger and um and i get that and i i commend that okay so now you have um a team so before we leave the topic of teams can you share with us your team philosophy and how you have your your team set up yes i loved hearing about stephanie's there at the tail end when i came in because I think that there's a lot of pressure to do the standard buyer's agents and other agents. I, like these ladies, have admin power. So I have three admins and two of them, 
two of them are licensed. And then I have one agent and she's just doing buyers right now. I really do not excel in training. So I leveraged that out to somebody else in the office. And so my one agent is now teaching one of my admins everything she learned. So I am hoping to have two other agents on the field doing mostly buyers and I only do listings and then plenty of admin help. I'm looking to hire at least one or two more in the next year. One or two more admins or agents? Admins. Okay, so can you chat with us about, because I, I like it, I like that you brought this up. Stephanie said she's heavy admin, you're heavy admin. What, what are your admins doing? Are they, is one or two doing marketing, one or two doing your transaction coordination from contract to close? Talk to us about how you set that up. Yes, one is purely contract to close, one is mostly marketing, one is mostly listings. Uh, you know, input and all this. Right. And then, right. of course, I have my husband who did take a sabbatical, bless his heart, from medicine. And uh, he he kind of takes care of the finances, which I hate. And um, he's also obviously very good at marketing. Yes, he is. Yeah. Yes, he is. And um, signs and all that. Oh, I do have a sign runner. That's all he does. A sign runner? Okay. Right. So do any of you mind, I know Katie, I appreciate your candor saying that when you brought your first admin on, you, you thought it was worth it to pay the 50,000 a year. Now I know that Stephanie, you're in LA uh, area, so I'm sure you know, you're know you paying an arm and a leg, but um, Cara, you're in more of a secondary market. Would you mind sharing with us what you're paying or approximations just so we can understand um, that kind of thing? Uh, since it's a mixture of salary and you, you know, closed transactions, I would say it varies between 40 to 60. Okay. And that's, a, the, and that makes sense. Um, you know, for, so you actually give them a salary plus they're incentivized to help you get the deals closed. And so as they close, they get paid something. Yes. Okay, and so I will save. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, so that's a total compensation. Yes. And then I will say that uh, probably a lot of other people do this, but I just shower them heavily with gifts <laughs> constantly. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, it's the work family and I want that kind of culture. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Well, that sounds really good. Now I'm going to ask Stephanie um, the next question. Um, do you have a retirement plan set up? Like, you are a power go-getter and like Kara, I know that um, when we initially talked, I don't know, three or four years ago, it wasn't, it wasn't out of the realm of possibilities that you'd be up at 11 o'clock or later working too, right? So do you, what, what, what's, your, what's your end game in real estate? Are you gonna sell your team? Are you going to work until you die? Chat with us about that. Sure, so Kara, I don't know how you stay up till 3 a.m. Um, uh, that's crazy. Uh, <laughs> although I do remember sleeping under my desk at the office. In fact, there was one time um, when I would literally sleep behind the desk and a client came in and my, my assistant was sitting in front and I was behind the desk behind her. My feet were sticking out and I was <laughs> passed out, called just sleeping. And I, I, she told me that she just looked right at the client and he said, is Stephanie around? No, she's not here. And I'm like, didn't he see my feet? Like, <laughs> So yeah, I, I understand the little cat naps where you can get them. Um, so retirement. So I, you know, I, I think everybody is different and you, there's not a set plan for everybody, right? Like I like lima beans. Not everybody likes lima beans. That doesn't mean it's good or bad. Um, I'm a big saver. I've been planning my retirement since I was 10 years old, but not in the, not in the sense of, I want to sit on a beach and do nothing. Just I want financial security. So I've set up, uh, I st I've been saving since I was a little girl. I set up a um, uh, 401k when I was 20. I got pension plans. I've got DB plans. I meet with my CPA regularly based on what are the current um, 
tax benefits for the different types of programs because the tax incentives change. Oh no, now you can do this program. No, now they have this program. So I will max out every year, whatever it is. And whatever you do though, you have to do for anybody you pay. So if you put money away for yourself, you have to put money away for them too. So that is one of the benefits that I give. I don't pay for health insurance, but anybody who works for me will have a pension or a defined benefit plan. They'll be part of my plan. So I have that. And then also um, I collect real estate. I like to buy shoes and I like to buy real estate. So those are the, the things I have, but I don't, I don't see like, okay, when I have this much in the bank or when I have this many houses, I'm going to stop. I like, I like the action. I like what I do and it's, it's fun. And I think that work is only work if you'd rather be doing something else. So for somebody, it might be, oh, if I have two houses or 10 houses or 20 houses or a hundred houses, whatever it is, or if I have this much in the bank, then I can stop and do something else. I don't have the something else. So for me, um, I, don't, I don't know what I would do if I, I, I think I'd be bored. And I think my husband would kill me because I'd probably drive him crazy. <laughs> well, thank you for that candor. Again, I just love this. And Stephanie, you know, I just, am, I asked you that and I thought you would say that because I want people to understand that when you love it, it's not work. Mostly. Like, there are know, days. Absolutely. There I mean, are days. yeah, we have hard days, right? Real estate, we're dealing with human beings who have emotions and things happen. But for the most part, um, she loves what she does. So she's living her passion. Um, Katie, I want to know, what is the most important thing that you do every day? What, what is your priority in terms of your schedule? Because a lot of agents are like, I need to get in a rhythm, but I'm not really sure what to do. And they, they, they sit in overwhelm. So I'd love you mm -hmm. to share what your priorities are in a given week? So my priorities are um, really spending time with my family. Um, and I'm pretty good at only working from like eight to six, eight to five. And on weekends, I only work Saturday mornings. Um, and so that's really important to me. But I also, I exercise every day. Um, I, I didn't always do that. Um, I did read The Miracle Morning, which I think is a great book for anybody who's sort of stuck. Um, and that helped me a lot kind of prioritize exercise, but then I got a Peloton. And so I'm, I'm on the Peloton almost every day for at least 30 minutes. Um, and I find that if I'm not exercising, it doesn't help me. So I would say that's the one thing for sure I'm doing every single day. And if I'm not, there's a specific reason why. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so for work, now you're putting, and I appreciate that you have boundaries. I so respect that um, for family and exercise, totally important. And then you can give, um, you know, do your important priorities first. Now let's put on the business hat. What is your priority? My priority is um, right now, I would say right now it's been sort of where are we going with this future? It's been a little rough over the last few, few months to stay, I would say to stay focused. Um, so trying to be a leader for the rest of my team um, is important. And also I am anticipating kind of my own next phase of my life too um, in transitioning to another state. So having kind of a dual business. So that's kind of where my focus has been is how am I going to do that? How am I going to transition? And what does that look like? Um, so that's been a priority for me as well. Um, I think that, uh, I, th I think that's probably really where my focus has been lately. And when you're an agent, think back to when you were an active agent. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know you're an active agent, but you know, like really in it, yeah. um, grinding, if you will, as you're building your business, going from, you know, 80,000 to 150,000, and then going from there to, you know, the next echelon or level over a quarter million income. Um, what was your priority then? And what, it, what do you feel is the priority that needs to be for, to, in order to be a successful real agent or broker? So I think the real priority has to be accountability to yourself um, and no one else. I also think it's important to be authentic and truthful and um, to not put your commission first. So I think if you sort of operate, you're just gonna be honest with yourself. And if you say to yourself, okay, today, I'm going to sit down and I'm gonna make calls for two hours. And if you don't do it, 
you don't say to yourself, well, you know what, I didn't have time or my kids came in or something happened. You say, you know what, I screwed up. Like that's, and you, and you accept that and you own it. If you don't own it and you keep putting it off, you're just not going to succeed. So I would say for me, the most important thing that I do is I'm accountable to myself. I'm not accountable to anybody else. And, and that's why I've been so successful is just, you have to do it because you've said you're going to do it, not because somebody else is watching you. And, and if you can't do it, then you have to understand the reasons why you're not doing it. Um, and be honest with yourself about that. Did that answer the question? Absolutely. I love it. Okay. And ladies, what she's saying is, is that no excuses, whether she felt like doing it or not, she had to be accountable to herself and, and she, she gave herself heck for it if she didn't do it. Right. Um, so I really, I really love that. Okay. So Kara, um, you know, I only specialize in women. I think women, our brains are different. I just think, you know, God made us differently. And um, I want you to speak to, you shared with us from your heart that when you said no to uh, medical school and your husband was still there and you had debt and he had debt, you said, I had to make money. So I also know, because I know you, that, you know, there's some, some in, our, in, in our brains, in your brain, in my brain, as we were, you know, building our businesses, um, there was that you can't do it, self doubt, things like that. So, can you talk to us about how you push through that? What were your tricks, tips? How did you push through that? Because you said you needed the money. You, you know, you needed to be successful. There was no other option. That's a good question, Jen. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I think. <laughs> I, I do believe in the law of attraction. And I think that uh, for, it sounds like these ladies are all very athletic or, you know, do work out or sports or whatever. And I think visualization of the success, the win is very important. Mm -hmm. So I remember <laughs> we were living in this disgusting flat and um, <clears throat> on the med school campus. And uh, we literally had, I don't know, a couple hundred, couple thousand bucks in the bank at any time, which, you know, I'm like Stephanie and I like to save and have a very hefty cushion. So it was a different, you know, different time. And it was only five years ago. So yeah. I remember every night when I was sleeping, to fall asleep, I would visualize what my life would be like. Um, and I would, you know, really picture exactly the details and all this. And one of the things I pictured was driving a luxury white SUV. And that, and now, you know, I have a luxury white SUV and who cares? It's a car. Uh, but I think, again, and I pictured having two boys. I think we have more control of our lives than we actually think sometimes. And so now I'm visualizing new things for my next five years and just having that positive uh, truth about, the, about our lives is very important, I think. And when the doubts creep in just to, just to overpower them and just say, go away, you know, go away, replace it with that positive image. Not to sound very hippie and all this, but I, I really do that. Right. And so um, can you just share with us one or two doubts that you've had through the years? Because I want these ladies to understand that, that you're just like them, that, that whatever their doubts have been, yours have. So I'd love if you could name a couple, you know? Yeah. Doubts. Uh, I think it's a, it's a, it's a muscle, right? It's like working out, we build slowly. So at, at the beginning, I think I had a lot of doubts and now I'm at the point where when a doubt comes in, boom, I have a positive thing to say to myself, right? The self-talk is, I think, quite important, especially, you know, growing up in an abusive household where I was told I was worthless all the time. Just replacing that with my, my self-talk, I think, is important, which I know you understand. Um, I will say... <laughs> more than doubts, all the mistakes I made at the beginning, you know, I would pick up phone calls and 
I would just say the wrong things all the time, trip up and uh, just hang up the phone and think, what was that all about? And now it's funny because when I pick up the phone now, I don't care if it's real estate or whoever the heck it is, I, I've got it. I yeah. feel so confident on the phone. I'm sure everybody does at this point, but uh, I really sucked at talking on the phone five years ago. <laughs> like give us give us an example like and, and then I'll, and then I'll move on but but I think that if you could think back to a time when you got off the phone and said to yourself what the heck was that like like were you, like what did you say or what was the situation because I hear that all the time I think I I think I'll highlight two extremes one being too aggressive one being too passive and just letting the other person control the conversation too much and then they think this person has no direction. How can they sell my house? Mm -hmm. so doing that. And then on the other end, being too hyper aggressive about my abilities and skills. Uh, obviously that's not good either. So just learning to direct the conversation without being too assertive. I mean, I'm sure many of you are much better than at that than I am, but I just experimented a lot and because I'm such a perfectionist, I, I still think about those, uh, some of those conversations or those clients where I really messed up, but we never have failures. We only have opportunities. So, uh, you know, those mistakes are what drive me to keep getting better. And so I'm just grateful for the whole, whole journey of it. Thank you, Kara. Yeah. I mean, she said a lot there, ladies. And we just talked about this, was it yesterday or last Thursday, about if you want to be really good, fail a lot and be okay with it. Stephanie, um, how, do you, how do you stay focused? You know, because now you have this, you know, and, and even if you want to look back to when you didn't have, because right now you're, you're number one in Keller Williams. We can't imagine that, okay? So if you could back up a little bit, um, how did you maintain your focus as you were building your business? I know you've been in it 32 years and you definitely started when you were 12. Okay, we get that. Um, but if you could share some insight on remaining focused. So, you know, you know how there's certain times in your life when someone says something to you and you're like, oh, wow, that's, that, that it just sticks with you. And um, I was only in the business for maybe four or five, five or six years. And um, I was with a, an independent company at the time. It was the largest in the state of California. And the gentleman who worked Beverly Hills was always the number one agent. He was twice my age and he was amazing. And um, there was one year and it was in the um, early 90s when the market here went really bad. And so the high end market toppled. He wasn't doing much. And I was selling the Valley, which is the, you know, worker homes and um uh they waited to announce uh, the number one agent we were all at the at the gathering at the beverly hills hotel there was 2500 or 3000 agents and everybody thought it was going to be him again and so did i and that that was before you didn't know what your numbers were there wasn't an internet to follow along mm -hmm. um how you compared you didn't know and they announced it and it was me and there was this <gasps> over the audience that it wasn't the beverly hills guy and so I went up to get my award and afterwards he pulled me aside and he said, you know, congratulations, it's not getting there, it's staying there. And I was like, oh, what, what? <laughs> and that stuck with me. Okay. And so for me, it's about my own personal best, right? Like I don't want to not be the best that I can be. And no, I'm not number one every year, but you know, um, also, people want to see, once you've done well, they're like, I hope she doesn't do so good. So they want to see you fail. And I don't ever want, I'll never forget one time I had this horrible manager. This was years ago. And one month she announced, oh my gosh, Stephanie's not number one this month. Can you believe it? It's so-and-so. It's not Stephanie. It's not Stephanie. I was like, stop it. <laughs> so for me, it's just about, um, my focus is my, I'm, I'm not competing with other people, but man, I compete with myself. And if I don't hit certain marks, I just, I just beat myself up. And I think part of that's my, my nature. I wish I could tone that down a little bit. I wish I could turn it down a little bit. Um, but I think also you have to be true to your nature. Like don't fight who you are. 
That's awesome. Stephanie, there's so much in there. Um, it's true because you guys think, um, or you may think that when you hit it big, that, you know, it gets easier. No. <laughs> when I would go up in my career, and as you guys have gone up in your career, maybe this has been your experience. People do talk behind your back and say, oh, I wonder if she'll do it again next year. Or she's only doing it because right. they make up excuses. Yes, absolutely. I loved, I used to love to hear the, the excuses, the excuse, the, some of the best excuses that I got were, um, she does well because this was in the foreclosure market was really big. And when the foreclosure market was big, I went after that business. Um, and people said, um, she does really well because her dad used to be a very prominent banker. Okay. My father is a wonderful human being. Um, he's an aerospace engineer. Like there's nothing, <laughs> how, do, how do people come up with these things? Or the other one was that, and this was in the early nineties, that the reason that I did well, that was the year I beat the Beverly Hills guy, was um, they heard, this is the rumor, that I was sleeping with the owner of the company. Which then I'm saying, then why am I getting listings in Pacoima, which Pacoima is the hood of the valley, right? Like, like how do people come up with these rumors to make excuses <laughs> like why you're doing... But I just say, keep them coming. Let's, let's hear when they stop talking. That's when you need to start worrying. Exactly. Exactly. So your focus is self-generated because you said it's up to you. And when you heard that guy say, hey, congrats, but it's not getting there. It's staying there. It, it hits you like, a, oh, my. He yeah. gave me a hug and he slapped me at the same time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so the next question for Katie is, um, if you can, can you... Can you share with us, like, I want you to, you know, picture when you started, okay? You know how that is. But the moment when the light bulb went off, the moment when suddenly you could own being a real estate agent, you knew you were exceptional. Do you remember a time um, or how long you were into it and talk to us about how somehow something switched and you went from being a starting realtor in your brain to, oh my gosh, I got this. And, and you had more swagger and confidence? It's a good question, Ashley. And I, I don't know if I've ever really thought about that because like all kind of top producers, you just keep going and you don't really think about that anything's really good. You just think, oh, there's more that I'm trying to achieve. Um, so I would say it was probably in my, so in my first year, I sold $3 million in real estate in like six months. That's when I got my license and I was like, oh, this is great. You know, I didn't know. Yeah, I made, I got rookie, right. I got rookie of the year. I mean, I didn't, didn't, I was like, well, it wasn't that hard. You know, like I just did it. Um, the next year I sold 11 million and I still didn't realize that was like kind of a big deal, especially in my company. And then in my third year I sold 24 million. And so I doubled it. And then I became the number two agent in my town. And that's when I was like, hmm, this is, this is, I must be doing something right. Like that's when I finally started to think, okay, this just isn't a fluke. You know, and you said it exactly like, okay, well, is she going to be able to do it again next year? That was really when I was like, oh my gosh, am I going to be able to do this again next year? You know, and I did, and I did more even. So I think for me, that's probably when I realized that, um, that I had something different and that I started to be more confident in my knowledge of the industry where I didn't feel like I was always trying to find the answer. I felt like I knew the answer at that, at that moment based on the number of transactions that I had done. Awesome. So it was probably in my third year. I love how you said I, I, I wasn't, I was no longer finding the answer. I knew that I knew it. Hey, Kara, are you there? Because um, if you are, I have a question for you. I am sorry. Okay. I'm just heading okay, to Okay, so my question is, is that you're a listing queen. I know all of you ladies are. Um, Kara, talk yes, to us about why you think you get listings. Oh. Like, like what is it about you? I think it's because I make an emotional connection very quickly with people. That's why. How do you uh, do that? Uh, uh, I think I've said this so much to you uh, before where 
Jan, you're such a good listener. And I think in sales, it's like talk, 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 talk. No, it's listen. And I try to focus on me talking 20%, the client talking 80%. Mm -hmm. And that's just the client. It's anybody I talk to, really. If I'm trying to help them, I'm 20, they're 80. And so I am listening for data. I'm gathering data. And then when people talk, which everybody likes to talk, then you start using that information to gain their trust. Uh, this is all probably very obvious, but then I mirror, I mirror them. I focus in on their pressure points and then uh, try to instill that bit of trust. So when you do that, and then on top of that, you have the, you know, the awards and recognition behind you. It's a pretty straightforward choice, right? Right, right. I mean, on top of that, you want to zero in on their emotional reason for selling and obviously uh, use that. Okay, so the thing about Kara is she's extremely humble. And um, what I wanna say is that she doesn't just ask one question. She goes deep. She, because she went to a listing intensive of mine, which she was like a special guest because she definitely didn't need it. Um, but she doesn't have, do you have a listing appointment or a listing presentation now, or do you still go in without one? <laughs> oh my gosh. I still don't have one, but I, love it. <laughs> I will say I learned a ton from your listing intensive, a ton. And I really, <laughs> that's when I learned to really respect how much work you do, Jan. And nothing beats pure work and pure grit. That's it. That's exactly it. And thank you for saying that. But I want you ladies to understand, and I'm going to ask the same question to Stephanie. So you're next, Stephanie. Why do, why do you get the listings? And now you guys get them because you're number one. I want you to really think back to no. what you did, what was most important, you know. Oh, Stephanie's saying no. Okay, so tell us, Stephanie. I don't think people care because I've had so many people say, yeah, yeah, yeah. The last five people here said they were number one. I'm like, no, I really am. So <laughs> I don't think that that matters so much because they listen to it. I even had a client. So I go through, I mean, I say the same thing on every appointment and um, I referred him someone. I went through my spiel. He was interviewing agents. He needed somebody to help with organizing the house. So I referred him someone. This was before I had it. He calls me up and he says, oh my gosh, you know, the woman that you sent over, she told me you were number one with the company. I was like, yeah, what part of my whole book that I went through? Did you not hear me? So it's like, if that really hit home to me because they just, they're listening to it like blah, 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 blah. Like, yeah, I'm number one. Yeah, I do this. Yeah. And I go through it in detail. Like, I, so they half hear it and they half don't. It's a lot more how you make them feel. Mm -hmm. And that is by listening to them as, as Kara said. Kara, do you have a driver? What do, you do? <laughs> do you have a personal driver? Actually, I do. Um, right now, no, I do. I pay, I pay $22 an hour for a driver. Oh, that's awesome. Pennsylvania. But right now it's my husband. Say hi. That's a good driver. <laughs> <laughs> hi, Jeffrey. Hello, hello. But, but when he doesn't charge you $22 an hour. Oh. Is that a Tesla? My son is listening and he wants to know if you're in a Tesla. Yeah, yeah, it is. Right. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> But again, Tesla too. All right. So listen, I want to go back. So ladies, sorry. I want you to understand that Stephanie is more IBM corporate. Am I right, Stephanie? Your yeah, style is. I go through, I go through a very, um, I do believe in emotionally connecting. I think that's really important. You got to find who they are and how they function and you got to, you got to dance with them. You got to mirror them. Um, but I go through, I go through a very specific routine. I have them take me through the house and really it's not about the house. I want to hear them talk and I want to hear what's important to them in their house. Um, then I sit down and I go through me. Here's me. This is my story. This is how long I've been doing it. This is my track record. Here's a bunch of letters. Here's information. Then I go through depending. Usually I go through my marketing because after that they don't have any questions about what I'm going to do and how I'm going to do it. And then I talk comps and pricing. If they are a, um, a certain personality type, I'll cut right to price because they don't want to hear all that. And then I'll go back to the marketing. So I, you got to really know your audience. But I find that when I don't do my things, 
I, I, I miss, I miss, I have to have to get the whole thing. Okay. And then before we leave you and ask the same question of Katie, Stephanie, um, when you were starting out, how did you get your deals? Like, like what's your biggest tip for these women for lead gen? Ask for the business at the end of the presentation. Ask, is there any reason that you wouldn't feel comfortable in working with me? Are you interviewing other agents? Always ask, never assume. If they say, yes, we are great. You should, you should interview at least two or three. And then I, and if, if then I say, where am I in the lineup? Am I one, two, three? How, how many, where are you at? Oh, we just started. You're the first. Oh, you're it. This is it. We've interviewed seven. You're the last one. We're not talking to anybody more. Great. Can I ask how, how the others are? Did you, did you like any of them? Have you narrowed it down? Ask. And then I always ask, it's hard to get the listing on the spot. That usually doesn't happen with most people. And I'm not a hard closer, but I do ask. And so I will say, listen, outside of going through all of the decisions that, you know, all the, the discussion that you're going to have after sitting through three of these, five of these, whatever, um, is there any reason that you wouldn't feel comfortable in doing business with me? And that's when they'll tell you, well, you know, one of them is my sister's daughter. And if I don't list with her, they'll shoot me. Or one of them is going to do it for 1%. They'll tell you what their objection is. And then I'll, I'll just, I'll try to address that. And then also if they say, no, we just, if they're real close to the vest and they say, no, we just really need to talk about things. We don't make any decision on, we have to sleep on it. I just say, great. Just all I ask is that you give me the opportunity to revisit any concerns that come up before you sign any papers or make a final decision. They don't always do that, but at least I've floated that out there. And then I always ask, when can I check back? I don't leave that open-ended. I make them tell me when I can follow up. And if they start to hem and haw, I'll say, how about three days from now? Like I'll give them a short but reasonable period of time. And then man, I follow up on that day. I think that's great. Now, ladies, they're coming from a place of curiosity. And like I said, Kara goes deep when she's talking to a seller or probably a buyer if she does any buyers. She asks questions because she wants to get the information so she can use it to prove that she's emotionally invested to really, to really connect. And Stephanie says the same thing in just a different way based on their distinct personalities, okay? Um, but I guess, that's the closing aspect. Um, and I don't mean to like harp on Stephanie, but before I move with Katie with the same question, Stephanie, where do you, when you were younger in terms of not your age, but in terms of your um, being in the business, how, where did you get your leads? Were they online? Were they because you were a big networker? Are you? There was no online. <laughs> <laughs> was, there was no line. The only line was a telephone line. Um, I did the basics, door knocking, open houses, mailers, farming, the basics, mm -hmm. very basic, wherever I could. And, and, and she was consistent. And so she did the work. All right, Katie, I want to know from you, um, you know, about your whole, how are you a listing queen? What's your, you know, I know you're probably mirroring what these ladies are saying, but I'd love to hear it in your own yeah. work. So um, I... I have a process that I've been doing now for almost two years. Um, and I, I have a specific, I've written it out. So I highly suggest you write down your process from the moment you get a call until you get the listing basically. Um, so when I get a lead, I, I will connect with them. If I get an appointment set up, I immediately invite them in a Google link, um, a Google invite. And I have in my Google calendar, one, in my can, one calendar is only listing appointments. So I can literally go through and see all my listing appointments for the whole year in my calendar. And then they'll get that and it puts it on their calendar. But I actually have a, a seller questionnaire that I send out ahead of time. It's like a Google form. Um, and I ask all the questions in there that you might be afraid to ask when you're at the listing appointment. So like, um, are you interviewing other agents? Who are you interviewing? Have you written an offer in the last 12 months? Um, are you prepared to sign my, you know, are you prepared to sign the agreement today after we meet? And you know what, Stephanie, I mean, I agree. Most people won't, but I've gotten people who have said yes. And I'm like, oh my gosh, they're ready for me to do a close right then and there. You know, do you have a, um, anything left on your mortgage? Um, so you ask all of those questions 
that, and sometimes they don't answer them, but at least, so at least I have that information going in. If they don't fill out the sell, seller questionnaire, does two things. It weeds out people who aren't really interested in selling because they don't want to take the time or they're just using you. Um, so then you're like, and then they'll probably cancel because they're not really serious. Um, you know, and it also just gives you some great information. So, you know, when you go in there, what you're kind of faced with, who, who are the decision makers? Will both decision makers be at our meeting? Things like that. So that's really my process. And I do a one step um, where I can give them a price there when I'm at the house. Um, I don't like to do two step. I'm a high D personality. I'm not going back. Um, it's just the way I am. So I'm, pr I've become pretty good at closing there and then finding out if I'm really in line. So by the time I walk out of that meeting, I pretty much know if I'm going to get it or if there's a chance I'm not going to get it. Like they, they've lined up with another agent maybe. And, um, okay. So we're out of time. I'm going to ask each person one question and that question is the same. And it is, what is the one piece of advice? I know we've talked about a lot today in this time and I, we really, really appreciate you ladies, um, taking time out of your very, very busy day to share with us. Um, if we can start with Kara, then Stephanie, then Katie, if you could just share with us, you know, a minute or less, whatever you want to share with, um, if you, if, if, if your son or daughter, we're going to be a realtor. Okay. Think of it that way. What is most important? What would you share? Kara. Sorry. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. I think the one thing I would share is, um, my son or daughter. Okay, I'm sorry. I think the one thing I would share is you don't have to get everybody and you're not going to, right? Like Stephanie was saying, sometimes it's they're going to use their aunt or their brother-in-law, sister or whatever. So don't worry about it. Uh, you just try to focus on the people that are going to make the process most pleasant for you. And that way you'll be motivated to work harder for them and you'll have a more enjoyable time and be more motivated to find more people. So if there are people who are draining you, just fire them. Just let them go or don't even fight for that listing, uh, for that lead because there are so many leads. I mean, I throw away 50 to 100 leads at this point. Not that that's healthy, but there's always business, always business. And I'm not in some metropolitan city, right? So. I think the quality of our experience as realtors is important, especially because the barrier to entry is low. There are so many agents out there. And so we really need to go for the quality. That's what I think. Because I did not do that at first and it was less lucrative and more exhausting. Oh, I love that. And so what she's saying, ladies, boundaries. Know who you're, you know, if, if it's just not gelling, offer them to someone else and say, you know, I, I just think we're not a good fit. Thank you, Kara, very much. Let's give Kara an applause. Thank you so, so, so much. Thank you, Kara. Love you. All right, Stephanie, please share with us your best advice. I would say give yourself time and come up with a plan and stick to it. And that after, after time of farming an area, stick to the basics, it will, it will happen, but give it time, give yourself time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, uh, and, and so I just want to ask you, what is, because it's very subjective, give it time. Is it six months? Is it a year? What do you, you know? Um, I think that, I mean, it's, it's, it, I don't want to, it's hard to say because otherwise it can work for somebody or against somebody. Oh, I'm not doing enough and it's been six months. I'm not doing enough and it's been a year or I got a year to do this. <laughs> so I think it's a matter of, um, creating your plan, like literally I would have in the beginning, I had my calendar and I had door knocking Monday, Wednesday, Friday, open house every weekend, cold calling in the afternoons. So once you have your plan, stick to it. And yeah, I mean, six months to a year should be sufficient and you can tie up any area by farming within a year to two years if you are consistent. But give yourself, you know, allow yourself to learn because the beginning is a big learning curve. It's a huge learning curve. Um, 
And so give yourself that time to learn. Love it. And do you see how focused she is? Monday, Wednesday, Friday, door knock, weekend, open house, afternoon. I mean, she had it down. Nobody created that. Correct me if I'm wrong. No broker, no mentor told you what to do. You, you took accountability for yourself and responsibility, and then you stayed diligent and focused, right? I did. And I found people in my office that were successful. And I would just say, hey, can I ask you questions? And then I would take bits and pieces and then I did it just like you would do a diet, right? Okay, no sugar, no ice cream, no this, no that. Only do this, only eat that. Exercise. It's it's the same thing. It's a, it was a business plan. And then I just said, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick to this for 12 months, whether it works or not. I'm not gonna give up, even when they slammed the door in my face, door knocking, and I had to pull myself out of the car with by my ponytail because I was dying, hated door knocking, but it works. Yay. Thank you so much. Let's look, give Stephanie an applause. Thank you so much, Stephanie. You're really, really amazing. So respect you and admire you. Okay, Katie, your best advice for us. You know, mine's actually a little bit like Kara's. Um, one thing you got to realize is there's more than enough real estate for everybody. And if you work hard, you're going to sell. Um, and so that takes away the stress of losing a buyer or losing a seller is that there's more than enough to go around, okay? So, and the, the other thing is you don't really know a reason why you might have lost a deal, you might have lost a buyer, you might have lost a seller. You don't know what's going on in their, in their minds. And so if you're able to take away the personal part of it where, oh my gosh, they hated me, I'm terrible, I didn't go, do a good job, rather than thinking maybe their sister's a real estate agent and they just wanted my cost, you know, maybe if they were afraid to tell me, because, you know, if you think, so I've sold, you know, 425 homes in the last eight years, how many people said no? I, I mean, a couple thousand probably. So you, you just have to keep going. And if you keep going, you're going to do great. And there's more than enough real estate to go around. I love that. Keep going. And I love how you said, if you do 400 deals, a thousand people said no. And that's exactly what we talked about the other day, isn't it, ladies? Thank you, Katie. Let's give Katie a round of applause. Congrats on being an icon. And um, I just love all three of you ladies. And thank you so much for giving us your time. Thanks for having us. Have a great us. rest this of your week. This is really great. This is great. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, ladies. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye.